and if you're a Luke, it's what'd you get? So uh, what'd you get? What'd you get today? So this morning uh, we have some we have teenagers who are crossover teenagers. To qualify to go to teen Sunday school class, you have to be in seventh grade or thirteen. And we have some uh, kids that are actually going into seventh grade, so they qualify, or they can be thirteen in case you know they never make it to seventh grade. And 13 qualifies them, so one or the other things. But you know what happened? I looked and I thought I'd have some of them in my Sunday school class. No, they went to Mrs. Price's Sunday school class. And we had donuts and milk. And Brother Tosh took everybody to Safeway and bought them like juices. So I don't, you know, what in the world? Yeah, we didn't have milk. Anthony put our milk away. <laughs> he took it outside and he brought it back in, put it in the fridge. Anyway, but marvels. I know that's not interesting to anybody who's not interested, but uh, I want to go to Matthew chapter 1. We're going to be studying some messages in Matthew 1. The focus of our, the focus of our sermon series as we preach through Matthew, we won't preach through every part of it. We are going to look at a lot of the prophecy in Matthew, and that will be one of the things that we sort of focus toward. And we are be just going to introduce ourselves in the genealogies today. And so we're going to just start in Matthew chapter 1. I used to have the genealogies in Matthew 1 memorized. Can you believe that? Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas, and his brethren, and Judas begat Pharaoh, and Zerah, and Thamar, and Pharaoh uh, begat Ezra, and Ezra begat Aram, Aram begat Amenadab, and Amenadab begat Nassan, Nassan begat Solomon, Solomon begat Moses, so on and so forth. I used to know that, and uh, it was, it's been a real help to me, actually. It's been a real help to me. And I've had people before that tell me, you know, I'm studying the Bible. One of the things that just bogs me down is genealogies. What's a genealogy? Well, it's just heritage. Now, for some of you folks that are around 40 and you're wondering where you came from and have gone on to, you know, Ancestry.com or whatever, now, has anybody watched, seen, I've seen some television commercials uh, that say something like, I thought I was whatever, German. I found out I was Irish or something yeah. like that. I'm, not, I'm a little skeptical about these Ancestry.com or whatever is whatever these commercials are that that do DNA tests to find out what your heritage is, I'm a little bit of a skeptic about that. If a guy thinks he's German, finds out he's Irish, I'm not just going to wear a kilt just because, you know, it's like because of some some uh, test. But having said that, a lot of people are interested in ancestry, and if you get to study the genealogies of the Scripture, you'll find that there are some things that really help you with your overview. First of all, studying the genealogies, if you're taking notes, will help you to just record what was happening. In other words, the genealogies is really God tracing. These are people that were godly. These are people that were part of the prophecy of the Messiah. That's what we're actually going to see today. When you read the genealogies in the Old Testament, you'll come to understand some interesting things. For instance, did you know that Noah was only about one and a half generations removed from Adam? You think about that. The Bible says in Noah's day, in Noah's age, that the sons of God had married the daughters of men. That is, the people who had come from Seth's godly seed had married people that came from Cain's ungodly seed. And the Bible says it, they, their thoughts, they were just wicked on the earth continually. There was, it got to the place where just everybody on earth was wicked. And I think of wickedness today. Wickedness oftentimes begins with the premise of denying that there's a God, doesn't it? I mean, wickedness usually begins by saying, God didn't create the world. There is no God. And so on and so forth. Can you imagine Noah being really just a couple of generations removed from Adam where literally he'd know people who were alive when Adam was still living? And if anybody knew where original sin was and where the world came from, Adam might have, don't you suppose? Yeah. And yet, and yet... The world was so wicked that God destroyed it except for eight people. There were only eight people that weren't wicked on the earth. And friend, I just have to tell you something. What determines whether or not you're wicked is your heart, not the facts. And so genealogies are helpful for me. I've gone through and looked at, wow, look, you know, this person lived this long. This is how long they're dead. And just added it up. It's a real help. Well, let's look at some genealogy today. And I want to find an encouraging couple of nuggets of truth in the genealogies as we're introduced to Matthew. So we look at verse 1 of Matthew chapter 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Now it's interesting. 
Uh, well, I, I won't comment on that yet. Okay? Second part of the verse, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And Judas begat Pharaoh and Zerah of Tamar, and Pharaoh begat Ezra, and Ezra begat Aram. And Aram begat Amenadab, and Amenadab begat Nasan, and Nasan begat Solomon, and Solomon begat Boaz of Rachel, and uh, Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. And Solomon begat Reboam, and Reboam begat Abiah, and Abiah begat Asa, and Asa begat Josaphat, and Josaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat Ozias, and Ozias begat Jotham, and Jotham begat, uh, I'm sorry, not Jotham, Jotham, and Jotham begat Achaz, and Achaz begat Hezekiah, and Hezekiah begat Manassas, and Manassas begat Ammon, and Ammon begat Josias, and Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Salathiel, and Salathiel begat Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel begat Abiyad, and Abiyad begat Eliakim, and Eliakim begat Azor. And Azor begat Sadok, and Sadok begat Achim, and Achim begat Eliad, and Eliad begat Eliezer, and Eliezer begat Mathen, and Mathen begat Jacob. And Jacob begat, isn't that interesting, Jacob and Joseph? Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Now, let's pray, and then we'll begin to comment on this passage of Scripture. And I believe we're going to learn some things today that will help us. Father, I pray that you would enlighten us by your word, thrill us with your plan and with the gospel. And God, I pray that today, looking at the individuals that you used in the lineage of of Jesus Christ. I pray that God that our hearts would be encouraged by our lineage and what we are because of Jesus. We pray in His name. Amen. Well, first of all, it's interesting. I, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but I think it would be important to note that Matthew's Gospel is in much every way a different Gospel than John's Gospel. Matthew's Gospel traces Jesus Christ as King of the Jews. In other words, Matthew is showing that Jesus is the King of the Jews. Now, I'm not saying it's not a Gospel. The Gospel, simply put, if you want to summarize or encapsulate the Gospel in a word, the Gospel is Jesus. Jesus is the Gospel. It's as simple as that. The fact of it is, is that anybody who knows who Jesus is and believes on Him is saved. Amen. That's how simple the Gospel is. There are many individuals, though, who would take Matthew and look at some of the teachings of Jesus that were for disciples, intended for disciples who are to follow Jesus, and they will make discipleship the Gospel. Discipleship is not the Gospel. Disciples are followers of Jesus. The Gospel is Jesus. And so there are many individuals that will take Matthew and they will preach from Matthew a different gospel than what Jesus preached to Nicodemus in John's account in John chapter 3. I will say this to qualify. If you are seeking to understand the gospel, the best place to go in the gospel is, not that the gospel isn't all through the scripture, I'm not saying that, but the best, best place to understand the gospel in its entirety is with the person who knew the gospel the best, and that is the person who was the gospel, Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same as in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. Yeah, so Jesus is the gospel. And the best place to go is when Jesus explained to Nicodemus, who knew all the religion, who explained to Nicodemus what the gospel simply was. And ultimately, he used the illustration that was not coincidental. You ever wonder sometimes, like when you read the Old Testament Scripture, why did God do that? One of the most perplexing accounts in the Scripture, if you don't understand what it was for and what God was going to do, well, there's two perplexing accounts. One 
would have been the Passover. Do you think the Passover might have been confusing if you didn't know what God was going to do? Take a lamb, shed its blood, and paint its blood over the doorpost? That's confusing, isn't it? That would, to me, would be, you know, the life of the flesh. There are a lot of things that teach what that is, but it's a picture of the cross. And Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. God knew what He was doing when He had Israel sacrifice a Passover lamb, when He provided a Passover. And when Jesus died on the Passover, He was the Lamb. And so it was a picture. But I'll tell you what's really confusing is using snakes. Yeah. Right? Because in the garden, who was it that beguiled Eve? The serpent. The snake, right? And so in the wilderness, I can understand using serpents for judgment, but lifting a serpent up in the middle of the camp, that's a tough one for me. Why would God want... I mean, could... could the, the, the hypothetical question, I don't like hypothetical questions too much, but the hypothetical question, could God not have healed people without using a serpent on a pole? He's God, right? The way or the method that God heals people. But there was a picture in erecting a, a pole in the, in the center of the camp. I mean, you're talking about a couple million people at least. How big must the camp have been? How, how high must have been the, the serpent on, on the pole? Well, it was the, the, the serpent was small enough to actually um, fit in the Ark of the Covenant, or, or no, to be kept as an artifact. And ultimately one of the kings who destroyed the high places destroyed that brass serpent because people were worshiping it. And that's what people do sometimes with artifacts. But that serpent wasn't that big, but, but uh, I'm to believe from the account of the Scripture that that serpent was visible from everywhere in camp. You ever see just a prominent place? There's a place in Kansas where I grew up, not very far from here. By the way, Kansas is not flat. Okay, there are actually only a few areas in Kansas that are flat. There are far more flat places in Florida and in Colorado and in North Carolina than there are in Kansas, if you've ever actually been there and been to anything but the Colorado parts. It gets flat in Colorado when you're going there, but Kansas is not flat. But there's an area in, in our area called Coronado Heights, and there's just like this, I don't know who put it there and what it was put there for, but supposedly it's a place where Coronado passed through on you know, his exploration. But it's just a building and it's on a hill. And you can literally see that building for just forever, just miles and miles and miles away. And that's the way this, this serpent on the pole would have been in the camp in the middle of Israel. It was erected so that any person who was bitten by a poisonous snake just had to look. Can you imagine being bit by a serpent having to travel? You're dying and you've got to get to the serpent? No. It was, look, that's the way the Bible uh, signifies it. My friend, God has done everything to reach where you're at. God's done everything so that Christ, literally, if you'll just look, He's, he's just there. He's already there. You know, God's here today. God's presence is in this room. If you're here today and you don't know, you don't know God, my friend, you don't have to travel. That's the kind of a God He is. And that's the way the Gospel was, what God wanted the people to realize. And so, I just want to qualify before we study, our, study Matthew, that I want to look at the introduction. The Bible says the book of the generations of Jesus Christ. That's how Matthew introduced his Gospel. In other words, Matthew did not say, this is the book that tells you how to be saved. It has the Gospel in it, the gospel is commanded to be preached in Matthew. But if I'm going to try to understand the gospel in its simplicity, I'm going to go to John's gospel, and I'm going to go to chapter 3 where Jesus explained the gospel. Does everybody follow that? You say, Pastor, why do you make so much of that? I'll tell you why. Because there's a great majority of preaching today that makes the gospel unattainable to most people because it requires more than simply looking to Jesus. Yeah. I would just tell you, if you read the average gospel tract, you'd be surprised at how muddy receiving Jesus as your Savior is. You read the, the average quote, sinner's prayer, that people would have people to pray, 
And the gospel is complicated and difficult. Have you ever read a sinner's prayer that said, God, and it just had all these things? I know that I'm a sinner. Well, you can't get saved. You won't get saved unless you know you're a sinner. That's pretty well understood, isn't it? Or is what are you being saved from if you're not a sinner? God, I know I'm a sinner. Uh, God, I'm asking you, I'm confessing my sin. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. And, oh, wait a second. Does God forgive sin? No. Yeah. Well, it's kind of interesting. God doesn't forgive sin before you receive Jesus as your Savior. Christ paid for our sin. And so, what are you asking for when you ask to be saved? You ask to, you're asking to be forgiven? Well, if you're asking to be forgiven because Jesus paid for it, but what you're asking for is the gift of what Jesus did when He became sin. When He died on the cross and was buried and rose again, you're saying, God, I want the free gift of eternal life. That's the gospel. God, I'm looking to Jesus. That's the gospel. And, I've, and, and, and Christians wrestle over the word repentance. They, they struggle over the word repentance. Some Christians will say, you know, you don't believe in repentance for salvation. And I have to say, well, the way you define repentance, no, I don't. But when you talk about looking to Jesus, I believe in repentance. They'll add the word repentance in. If you don't have the word repentance in your sinner's prayer, you're not saved. Well, my friend, no person comes to Jesus without turning from their sin. They, uh, repentance is understood. But usually it's people promising God, God, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to stop sinning. And then they'll say, well, you know what? You have to have fruit to show that you're repentant. Before you can say, no, 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 my friend, the Gospels look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. All of those things, a lot of the things happen when you look to Jesus. But looking to Jesus is just looking to Jesus. Pastor, do you believe in repentance? Yes. But is repentance turning from my sin or is it turning to Jesus? Well, you can't turn to Jesus without turning from your sin, but some people make turning from your sin the whole idea of repentance. I don't believe they're saved because I don't think they repented. Well, how do you look to Jesus without repenting? In other words, you take spiritual victory and you take the Christian life and instead of teaching people how to walk in the Spirit and how to have victory over sin and how to turn things that are for believers after they've received Jesus as their Savior, and you make those things a part of the Gospel when they're not. And so I want us, as we study through Matthew, we're going to clarify. Who is Jesus talking to? Is He talking to the lost? Or is He speaking with His, his disciples? There's a big difference, isn't there? Between Jesus talking to His disciples and Jesus talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees, for instance. Okay, so, now let's look at a few things that are going to show us the character and nature of God. I want to just look at three ladies in the genealogies. Uh, please notice, please notice the way that the scripture is written. Abraham, and I'm not being silly here, but Abraham, male or female, help me. Yeah. Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac, male or female, help me. Yeah. Male. Okay. Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob, male or female. Yeah. Thank you, Luke. Luke's quick. Jacob begat Judas yeah. and his brethren. Male or female? Male. Male. Okay. Judas begat Ferris. Male or female? Male. Judas. Male. Ferris. Male or female? Sarah. Then notice it says of Tamar. Tamar. Male or female? Female. Female. Okay, when you when if you, if you've just never studied the scripture before and you don't know the Old Testament of the Scripture, and you look at this woman, Thamar or uh Tamar or however you pronounce it in the Hebrew. Uh, when you look at this woman, Tamar, you realize, okay, we're talking about you know, the genealogy, and we're chasing the genealogy through the males, through the men. Tamar, female. Okay, so God put something in the Word of God, and obviously, if the Word of God is inspired, and if God preserves every word, then every word is there for a reason, isn't it? Okay, so Tamar is in the genealogies. She's a woman. First woman mentioned in the genealogies. And she's mentioned there. And she's there because God wanted her to be mentioned. Uh, let's look down just, just a little bit. Verse 5. 
And Solomon, Solomon male or female? Yeah. Male. We got Boaz, Boaz male or female? Yeah. Of Rahab. Rahab. Rahab, male or female? Yeah. Female. Okay. And then, uh, verse 6. Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon, of her that had been the wife of Urias. Now, there are three honorable mentions in the genealogies of Jesus Christ. Normally, genealogies would trace the man, the man's son, the son's son, the son's son, the son's son, the son's son. And even though the Scripture may in other places tell you who their mothers were, uh, the, the importance of the tracing of the line or the genealogy because of it being the lineage that was the seed of promise. I mean, in other words, God told Abraham, out of your seed, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And so it's tracing from Abraham forward, whom, specifically the family of whom, Christ would descend or be in the lineage of. Okay? But there are three females that are listed here. And for most of us, I think we kind of know the stories behind these. But for those of us that do not, and for those of us that can be helped by refreshing our memories, let's go to Genesis, first book in the Bible. Genesis chapter uh, 38. And uh, I want to read a little bit of an account about this lady, Tamar. Tamar. Before we read it, let me just tell you about something uh, that was understood in the day. And what was understood in, in the day was that if... What, what was understood was the importance of an inheritance. Now, particularly in the economy of Israel, and uh, Judah, who would have been one of the twelve tribes of Israel, God would have used Judah to be one of the twelve tribes of Israel, from whom Jesus came, the line of Christ, Judah uh, would have been from a seed or a family that the inheritance, which would be both the land, but would also be that lineage, being in the line of Christ, would have been a very important thing. And inheritance is always a very important thing. Let me illustrate it this way. This, this doesn't perfectly illustrate it, but it does a little bit, does somewhat. Uh, my grandfather passed away after being married to my grandma for 60 years. So they had 60 years of marriage. And great, they, they're just great folks, my grandparents were. And uh, actually, at the end of their lives, my grandpa was just in the Word of God, loved spiritual things. And, and uh, just, and we just, my grandpa was, my grandpa was the kind of guy that every one of us grandkids thought was the most awesome person in the world. He was just, I mean, if you'd ask us who's the most awesome person in the world, and you were to just give us a list of names, you could list anybody in it, but if you put grandpa's name in it, my grandpa would have been the person that all of us cousins would have said, no, grandpa's the most awesome guy in the world. He was just, we loved him. He was great. Uh, irreplaceable. Uh, my grandpa was a farmer, and he had inherited uh, some, some land from his father, who had inherited land from his father. We had in Salina the Price Farms, and they would have been, actually, if, if you, they were actually some kind of historical land. Some of the, the land that my father had, this, this is not really terribly pertinent, but uh, our family used to own the Indian burial pit. It used to be a landmark when you're passing through uh, central Kansas, a place you could go, and an archaeologist had, there had been a massive burial ground, massive burial area where just hundreds of people had died at the same time been buried, and that had been kind of exposed. And so anybody that actually used to go through Salina used to see out on the highway the Indian burial pit, and it was a landmark where if you went through Kansas, most people had been through Kansas at some time or other had been to that place. So that was some of my granddad's property, and some, some had been split up among some of his other family. And then also uh, he had had his own farm. My, when my granddad was uh, in his early 20s, he was going to move to the Dakotas because they were giving away homestead land. And his dad, instead of, uh, didn't want him to move away, his other son had already moved away, and he said, no, I want you to stay here. So he bought him a nice farm. And then through that farm, the city had decided they wanted to make a straighter line for a river channel to go through it. And they cut through the middle of his farm, made it into two farms, and paid him a lot of money for it. So he bought the farm that we all 
uh, kind of grew up on and really loved our farm out by Bennington, Kansas. It really is a pretty place, actually. We should have a men's retreat or something there sometime. You men would really enjoy it. Go out and just do a bunch of man stuff. On the farm, we've got about three miles of river, and there's a place where they actually they kind of come close together. And so you can get on an inner tube. Devin's been there and done that, haven't you? Mindy's been there in Yoakum. Yeah. You can get inner tube, on an inner tube here, and you can float on the river a few miles, and then you come back, and you're not very far from where you actually got on the river in the first place. And that's that's kind of neat. We have areas of timber on the farm, like 50 acres in one area, and then of just solid oak trees. And then there's some high ground where the pastures are at, and there's some cliffs about 150 feet high. And from the cliffs, you can literally see all the rest of the farm and all the river and everything that's down below us. It's, a, it's a, just a really pretty place. My granddad died uh, when he was 60, and the farm is the kind of a place for our family that you just would never sell because it's just... It's like Price family land, you know. It's like one of those things that's just kind of, it's like, a, you know, you would never want to get rid of. And my grandma had dated a guy when she was in high school. And he married a lady and was married for 60 years, and his wife died. They were both married for 60 years. She was in her late 80s, and he was in his early, I think either almost 90 or around 90 years old. And uh, they got back together after their spouses died. And I actually got to be part of uh, doing my grandma, my cousin and I did my grandma's wedding, which is kind of neat. And they had 120 years of wedding experience between the two of them. Uh, my grandma had been married 60 years, and my and uh, my old grandpa Bill had been married 60 years. And when my grandma called, she called me first, me and one of my other cousins, and she said, I'm getting married, and I want you to do our wedding. And she kind of wanted to sample what the family was going to say. But it's kind of weird having your grandma be married to your grandpa for 60 years and having mar have her marry someone else. It's just, it's not wrong, just weird, you know, kind of weird. And so uh, I had cousins call. What do you think about grandma getting married? So well, she's free to marry. Well, you know, one of the things that, uh, that came up with a bunch of them is, well, we want to make sure that the land stays in our family. It's just one of the things. As long as they get married, that's fine, but we want to make sure that the that the family land stays in the Price family. We don't want it to go, you know, Grandma marries someone else. We don't want Grandpa's land to be given to someone else. And that was a major consideration. I said all that just to, just to wake you up, guys, by telling you a story that has nothing to do with anything. And then uh, to say that an inheritance actually kind of, you know, there's, there's just something about the heritage. And in our family, you know, I mean, my grandpa was the greatest guy ever, and you just want his name to be remembered, and you want Price Family Land to stay Price Family Land. It just needs to be that way. You guys get what I'm saying here, what I'm talking about? And so this is an important consideration for this guy Judah. See, Judah's daddy is Jacob, who became Israel. And Jacob, that rascal, worked pretty hard to get his daddy's inheritance. Abraham. Remember Abraham? Esau was the firstborn of the twins, those two sons, in Israel. And by right, Esau should have had the birthright, which was not so much the land that Jacob hadn't even gotten yet. You know, Judah had spent most of his time, actually, a lot of his time in Egypt. They didn't have the land that belonged to to Abraham because God said he got it. But they had God's promise on it, and they also had the promise that was a spiritual promise, this heritage, that in Abraham's seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And being a son of Israel was a pretty big deal to the people that didn't profane it. Esau, pff, I'd rather have soup. I mean, you think about that. God's promise, your heritage, or soup. And Esau said, I ain't going to be alive when that all happens. Give me soup. So the heritage didn't mean anything to him. But you got to appreciate, before we go too far with this guy Judah, you got to appreciate about Judah that being Israel's son meant something to him. Are we? Are you there? 
I mean, okay, let me ask you a practical question. How many of you would like to be part of the age of, of the promise? It's not, it's not this, you know, maybe God, you know, Grandpa says, promise. I'm talking about God's angels came to Abraham and said. And God actually had made a covenant. Can you imagine Grandpa Abraham telling you about having a covenant with God? And God parts the bullock and He passes through it. He doesn't have you pass through it because, you know, you couldn't keep the covenant. And He tells you these things that are going to happen and you, get, you say, I'm part of that family. Well, I just want to tell you something. I don't want to be part of any other family if I'm Jacob's son. Right? So we can relate to this guy Judah. Let's read this story about Judah. I'm only going to get through Judah today. I don't think we'll make it much further uh, or make it very very far. Uh, look at this in uh, verse 6. Well, no, let's read the first several verses of chapter 38. It came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned in to a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. And, and Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went in unto her. So his wife was Shua. And she conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Ur. And she conceived again, bare a son, and she called his name Onan. And she yet again conceived and bare a son, and called his name Shelah. And he was at Chizab when she bare him. And Judah took a wife for Ur his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. Now what's significant about Ur being the firstborn? He's the I mean, he's number one son. He's the guy that gets mentioned in the genealogy who hasn't, isn't actually mentioned in the genealogy, interestingly enough, isn't it? He's the firstborn son. And so this gal, Tamar, married pretty well. Right? I mean, okay, you're a girl. And there's a family that God has spoken to and said, you're going to be part of the lineage of Christ. You want to marry one of those guys? firstborn son? Could you do better than to be in the lineage of Christ? Tamar married pretty well and never died. Rascal. And so <laughs> the Bible says, uh, and Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. Well, he was, a, he was a rotten guy. And it's interesting, the Bible doesn't say anything more than that. He was wicked, God killed him. Her was disqualified by God to be part of the lineage of Christ. Poor Tamar. She married the right guy, but he was a bad guy. God killed him. Uh, and Judah said unto Onan, Go into thy brother's wife and marry her, and raise up the seed to her brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. It came to pass when he went to his brother's wife, he spilled on the ground lest he should give his seed to his brother. In short, he refused to have a son and to have a son that his brother would get credit for because of his brother being the firstborn. In other words, that son would have been known as Judah's son. Now this is a little, little weird in our culture today, but understand what's behind the desire to have the firstborn son. The desire behind it is Tamar wants, he wants to, um, she wants to be part of the lineage of Christ. And the Bible says, the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. I don't know what what uh, Ur did, but I would say him and Onan were kind of peas in a pod. And God killed them both. And the Bible says in verse 11, Then Judah said to Tamar his daughter, While remain a widow at thy father's house, till Shelah my son be grown. For he said, Lest peradventure he die also as his brethren did. And so Tamar, the Bible says, went and dwelt in her father's house. So he said, Go home, live with your dad. And when Sheila's old enough to marry, you can marry him and have a son with him. In the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comfort, went up to his sheep searers, to Timnath. And, uh, and uh, anyway, long story short is that Judah, instead of giving his son Sheila to Tamar because she married... She had the right to be part of that seed because she married the firstborn son. Instead of giving her to the third son, he said, you know, she's a black widow. Every son she dies, God kills. And so, I've only got one left. And I'm not giving him to her. And then his daughter died. Now, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just thinking Judah needed some parenting 
uh, and some, some parenting help on how to raise godly children. I don't know that his daughter was necessarily ungodly, but the man is, is grieved and is mourning the loss of his children. Long story short, because she doesn't keep it, he doesn't keep his promise to her, Tamar, who knows what kind of a man Judah is, poses as a, a non-virtuous woman on the, on the side of the road, and Judah goes in unto her, and she ends up conceiving, and she took tokens from him. She took his ring, his staff, his signet, some things, because he didn't have money to pay her with. She kept his stuff. Judah heard that his daughter-in-law was with child, and he was ticked off. I said, you know, that's not right. She's supposed to be my son's, my deceased son's wife, and she's played the harlot. And so he wanted to have her killed. And when he called her out, she said, well, the child that I'm with is the person that has this ring and this staff and showed him his stuff. And Judah said, she's been more righteous than I. Some people here are looking stunned right now. You're like, ugh. And it's really a stunning story, isn't it? When you think about it. I mean, what a mess. What a mess. When you think about it. What a mess that Judah had the kind of kids that God killed. What a mess that he wouldn't keep his word with Tamar. And what a mess the conniving links, uh, lengths that Tamar went to in order to receive the promise that she should have had. And all Judah's, Judah could say in response was, she was more righteous than I am. She's better than I am. Which is not saying too terribly much. When you read Matthew chapter 1, let's go back there. Verse 3, the Bible says, Judah begat Pharaoh and Zerah of Thamar, and Pharaoh begat Ezra, and Ezra begat Aaron. And we can look at the story, how the twins are born. One puts his hand out, and they tie a scarlet thread, they knew it was going to be twins. And then he pulls his hand back in, his brother's born before him, but the one with the first thread was the first one out, so he became the heir of the seed of promise. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, that's how Matthew 1.1 1, 1 begins. We're reading, Abraham begat Isaac, man, his son. Isaac begat Jacob, man, his son. Jacob begat Judas, and his brethren. And isn't it interesting that the Holy Spirit uses uses the name Jacob instead of Israel in this genealogy? If we were to read down, you would recognize that Joseph, though he was in the lineage of the king, and though the genealogy of Matthew traces the lineage through the man, that Joseph was part of that lineage that was rejected from being the king because of a breach between one of his ancestors and God. And God said, you're not going to be in the lineage of the king. And so Mary came from the same lineage, but she would not have been part of that breach. We can look at that later in the future. And yet Christ, the Word of God said, is part of this generation. I want you to take one thing home today and I want you to misinterpret it or misunderstand it. The story about Tamar and Judah has terse sentences in it which say the person was wicked and God killed him. God is not okay with wickedness. Okay, so don't take the application today home and say, well, you know, I mean, we can just be wicked and God will still use us as long as there's something good in us. That's not what the Scripture's teaching here. But this woman, Tamar, who played the harlot, wanted to be part of the lineage of Christ. 
and God used her. And there's a woman in the lineage named Rahab, and she was a harlot. And she wanted to be part of the lineage of Christ, and God used her. Then there was just a common Moabite woman who married a little punk of a guy who died. And she said to her mother-in-law, when you go home, I'm going with you because your people are going to be my people and your God's going to be my God. That, that girl, Ruth. Or Ruth. And she wanted to be part of the lineage of Christ. And she married Obed and Obed Beget, uh, I'm going to say she met Boaz. She married Boaz, and Boaz uh, begat Obed. And Obed was Jesse's. Uh, Obed married Ruth. I mean to say, and Obed was Jesse's dad, and Jesse begat David the king. Then there's another woman mentioned, a woman who was married to another man, and had an affair with David the king, Bathsheba. The Bible says in Matthew she had been the wife of Uriah. I mean, the Bible says in Matthew, Solomon or, or uh, David begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah, another man's wife. And the Bible, my friend, does not mince words and it does not cover up anything wrong. And yet the conclusion of this genealogical line is Jesus. Jesus. And here today, my friend, you and I find one of the greatest contrasts between who God is and what man is. Don't take this the wrong way. Don't read into it things that I have not said. But I find more in common with Rahab than I do with Jesus. I have more in common with Tamar than I do with Jesus. I have more in common with Bathsheba and David than I do with Jesus. Because that's what I am. And that's what Jesus used. That's what God used to give us His Son. I want to draw some conclusion here today, if you'll allow. The only kind of a man that God saves is a sinner. The only kind of people that need a Savior are sinners. And in man's most wicked state of affairs, all that is brought to the forefront is the kind of Savior Jesus is. And the kind of loving God our Father is. Many of us today could say, Pastor, you don't want to go too far back in my family tree. I'm just telling you something. There are skeletons. They are. Near or far, but in your family tree, there are skeletons. There are things that have been hit. They burned the Price family tree. One of my dad's great aunts burned our family tree. Burned it. The first John Calvin Price to move from Pennsylvania to Kansas left a wife and five kids and went and just started another family like his whole family never even exists. Just abandoned his family. That's where the Price family comes from. People say sometimes to me, Oh, Ryan Price. I know a preacher by the name of Adolphus Price. Or I know this preacher Price. This uh, You related to them? I said, I ain't related to anybody good. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I come from a bunch of scoundrels. But our family met Jesus. And it just changed everything. And you know, Tamar met Jesus. <laughs> and Ray, Rahab, she met Jesus. And Ruth, she met Jesus. You say, Jesus wasn't born yet. Do you think that the women that want to be part of the lineage of Christ didn't know who Jesus was? They met Jesus. You think Jesus didn't exist until He was born of a virgin? 
He was that part of the Godhead that was responsible for the creation of the world. And then women met Jesus. And look what God did. Look what God did. And friend, I can't find a more encouraging place in the Bible to preach to people than from the genealogies in Matthew. Amen. I don't know what you've done. I don't know where you've come from. You say, Pastor, I, I don't like the comparisons today. Well, maybe I'll be a little more honest about yourself. You'd feel better about it. Because God doesn't save anything but sinners. When we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. I qualify. And that's good, isn't it? Father, thank You for what You've taught us from Your Word today. I pray that we would see ourselves not in the basis of external holiness, but God, may we see ourselves on the basis of what we are because of what Jesus was who never sinned and yet died for sins like Tamar's and Judas and like Rahab's. And God, for sins like every one of these individuals like David and Bathsheba for sinners. And God, it's just amazing to me that you could take something that's so marred and so imperfect and so representative of what man is and what man does. And yet, God, you could perfectly craft a plan for redemption and using it to legitimize your Son, who is not only the rightful heir to the throne in Israel, but who is God Himself. God, thank You for loving us. Bless and move in the invitation we pray this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. The invitation this morning is rather simplistic. I'd like to turn to page 125 in your blue hymn books. And as you're physically able to do so, if you will please stand. We're just going to sing, Jesus paid it all. If you're here this morning, you don't know Christ as your Savior, my friend. Look to Jesus. Right, right where you're standing this morning, as we sing, instead of singing, just pray, pray, God, I want Jesus to be my Savior. I want forgiveness. I want redemption. Through Jesus Christ, I'm looking to Jesus. You've never done that before. You can be saved right in the invitation time this morning and tell somebody about it, will you? You're here this morning, and maybe you've tried to find your worth or your identity in your works or your deeds or in your heritage, or the things that you've done. And in order to do that, you've got to cover up a lot of things. You've got to overlook a lot of things. Instead of overlooking those things, how about just looking to Jesus and saying, I find my worth, I find my identity in the righteous blood that was shed, my Passover lamb, my Savior Jesus. As God's spoken to you, let's stand, let's sing, and as God's spoken to your heart, you do business with Him as we sing Jesus.